statement this morning, funnin' but true. I love when Sunday comes so I can go to church and get saved again. <laughs> you know, uh, we've discussed this before and looked into history and all that stuff. Uh, Jesus came to deliver us, and everywhere you hear the word saved in Scripture is a Greek word called sozo or sotero, which means being delivered. Uh, it's a big difference in that you got on a train that you heard. How I many caught the train this morning and went by? Okay, if you didn't hear the train, your brain dead. Wake yourself up. I stand amazed that there's a God in heaven that sent his son and said, would you be the rescuer of those people? They got bad thoughts in their head. The demonic forces are still on earth. How many of you believe that? Jesus came casting out demons and healing the sick. Now, wrap your head around that. If they don't really exist, why did he do that? If they don't really exist and they're not really a problem, then why did he command the apostles, go forth, cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead? Are we in agreement that's what scripture said? So if it's there, I know, it died, it went away, right? I, there ain't nothing hellish or bad that ever dies. It just hangs around and lingers like the odor of those fields out there. <laughs> We have this invitation from a, a real God that set up heaven and earth to see who would want to be his kids. And then he set up an adoption process. And the problem with our stinking thinking is that, well, I'm already saved. I belong to Jesus. Well, do you act like it? Do you do the family business? Are you dedicated to building the kingdom of God? Are you dedicated in becoming a foundational pillar of his truth here on this, this, this earth that's filled with lies? Or are you no different than the other trilobites that live in the sewer that have other purposes? So Jesus came to the earth and in our little time zone when you woke up and you said, Jesus, I want to make you my Lord. Now, just because you were born into the church doesn't mean that you're saved. You're not in an adoption process. I was speaking with Frank, wasn't it, Frank? That he, he realized, <laughs> he's up there, a little embarrassed, but he'll get over it. We were, can, can I tell that story, Frank? Go for it. Uh, we, we were in the back room and I don't know, we'd kind of been hobnobbing and he didn't know about this God thing and you know, I, I, didn't you have some other problems too, Frank? She's in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, which one of you didn't come without problems? I mean, you know, have, <laughs> have you figured out there's no problems from life out there? You're the problem. That's what Jesus has come for, to confront us with. You think it's everything out there, but man, have you smelled yourself? <laughs> it's you. And he said, you're the one that needs help. So Jesus didn't come to deliver fence posts and telephone posts. He didn't come to just make skies blue for you on the day that you wanted. He came because... I'm some kind of turnip here on earth that used to belong to God. And he says, I, I want to see if you, Mr. Turnip, want to be adopted by him who's this great God. Lives in a different place, has a different kingdom, has things you can never, never, never even think about. You know, our mind cannot conceive the great things that God has for us right now, nor can it conceive it in the future. Uh, you know, you, you, how many of you watch all the sci-fi shows or did, used to? <laughs> yeah? The rest of you, uh, somebody's a liar out there. I only saw two hands go up. 
so we're, we're here for one reason and that's to see if today we can get a little bit better signing on the contract you know when I talked with Frank he he really realized for 20 30 years and when it revelation hit him what did you say Frank Oh, it, it was a little more dramatic. Oh, God, I haven't signed the contract. Am I right? Yes, sir. <laughs> we were in the kids' room, so. It became a revelation to him that, you know, unless you sign the contract, somebody else can't sign it for you. You know, I used, I'm still a good Southern Baptist, but I thought they signed the contract for me, and I was born into it. It didn't work. I kept hearing this voice calling me. And if you don't hear a voice, it means you don't belong to God. Now, my question is, what are you stinking up his living room for if you don't belong to him? You're not going to stink up heaven if you don't belong to him. So what's our central aim today? Is it, you got a hot dog planned after this? Lobster? Or did you come because you realize you have a need that you don't even know you have? You know, if you're if you're uh, if you're gloomy puss all the time, if you deal with a lot of depression, the scripture says that there are a lot of the demonic forces and they bring oppression. Now, I don't care whether you believe in the Bible or not. I believe God. And he said, the main problem we have is demonic forces speaking to us and bringing oppression in our life. Oppression in our relationships? How about a little oppression on the old wallet where the cash squirts out like toothpaste? Can't hang on to it. How about oppression because you're, you're getting on and you're finding out you weren't that great movie star or rock star or best hunter or best best this. You, you find out you were just a toad back there. And all those things start hitting you when you get about my age. And you start, oh, I, I thought I was so hot. <laughs> and now I look at it and I think, Lord, how did you stand me? How did you stand me? Hey, I just, I just almost weep sometimes because I, I can find no good thing about myself in the past. I still can find no good thing about myself right now. And it, that's the truth of the state of our souls. We can't find any good things where there's no good thing there. But if you have signed a contract personally yourselves, it means that you said, I want to start the adoption process. And if you don't want to start the adoption process, I promise you there's a nice, warm place, warmer than Texas for you. But God said, I, I don't want to see you perish. I, I don't want to see you. I don't want to have to take you by the scruff of the neck and throw you into hell. So he gives you, if you're here, it's for the purpose that you could hear. And that's not just hear with the ear. It's hear God. He speaks too. So that you can make a decision whether you want to respond to him to enter the adoption process. And it's a legal process. And how many of you know legal stuff is it's thick in paperwork? Well, here's the thing. Jesus says he's our advocate. You know what that means? It means he's your lawyer in heaven every time... The adjudication comes up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yep. Remember, he stands in between us and God's wrath. And when we got a fried noodle and we're not doing it right, and we're playing tennis with Satan and he's our best friend, you, you realize he's the me, myself, and I guy. All he does is talk about himself and gets you to do the same. If you're playing tennis with him, you're on his team and he's your enemy and he's God's enemy and he wants to keep you from being a part of God. And he speaks to you all the time, so you examine whether God's real or not. 
for you will judge God. I beg of you, don't judge God. Come to him and let him free you from the nonsensical things of life, of our super intelligence that these demonic forces speak to us. Jesus still is here and still wants to deliver us from the influence of the thinking of these forces of darkness so that our thinking will become light and pure and we'll be free. That oppression will lift. The bitterness will lift. And so while you're worshiping this morning, if you have something stuck between you and him, now I know you're not big enough to roll the stone away, right? That Lazarus in the grave. But somebody's on the outside, and that's Jesus, and he's going to be calling to you. And if he hears you inside your grave of your own mind, your own thoughts, your own ways, your own flesh, he's waiting to hear an answer from you. And if you answer him and say, here I am, Lord, he'll roll the stone away. And he'll leave your dead flesh in the tomb, but he'll resurrect the new spiritual man and woman of God so that you can come and walk with him. He'll set you free from your past. And he'll open your eyes to a new future with him. And how about a new right now with him? He's the only thing that's real because he says everything in heaven and earth is going to be melted away in a fever and heat. So he's the one that's real. He made this as kind of a matrix to see, oh, do you want me? Do you want me? And if he sees that, Now he's going to try to help you get to him and get away from the satanic forces that want to rule your life. So I have to preempt this to remind you what we came for. We need him. We need a great God to come back into our minds and into our hearts for we've been playing and fishing and doing all kinds of things out there. And when I go fishing, I want Jesus to go with me. When I go home and take a nap this afternoon. I I want Jesus to be there. Why? Because he's not a mamby-pamby fruit flake. He is a God that is a real man. He's a God enough to say, I'll take the blame for you. Most of us say, well, it's your fault, your fault. He says, stop, stop. I will take it. I've got big shoulders. You give me your lunacy, you give me your insolence, for my God, my Father, is going to set you on fire, and I came to stand between you and him. But you got to come to me. I'm the only one that's safe. He doesn't offer any other terms. This guy went and died a brutal death. And I don't know if the rest of you exist. I've done enough that he should have been crucified ten times. And I see him hanging there, I think, oh, Lord. And every time I see him hanging there in my thoughts, he said, would you give me more of your thoughts? Would you give me your crabbiness today? Would you give me your loud mouth today? Would you give me your hateful heart today? Would you give me your me, myself, and I today? Would you give me your ways today? Would you come over to me? You realize it's a criminal that walks away from God to go do its own thing and to play. It's criminal. Can you imagine the angel walking away from God? God says, I got plans now. Here's what I want you to do. I'm sorry. I'm over here hiking. Is that a criminal offense for an angel? I mean, we got to get it right for the adjudication. There's a great courtroom that goes on every day that you are sending away. And Jesus has to stand between God's wrath and you. And he is a super lawyer. The enemy comes in and takes a picture of you and he presents it in the courtroom. Yep, he did this and this. He's mine now. And Jesus says, nope, I can see through time. On this day, he's going to turn to me. Father, don't listen to this guy. I proclaim I will teach this person. So he's here to teach you and instruct you. 
question is, do you want a rhema? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Remember, that's God standing here speaking to us. Do you want that? And if you do, while we're singing, it's not a matter of us just singing. Worship is supposed to be, when they came and gave a sacrifice, that was called worship. Not little tunes out of a hymn book. Nothing has ever been accepted as sacrifice except the sacrifice of my goat nature. The sacrifice of what I want to do. There's what God will receive. And if you do that, then he has plenty in his kingdom. More than we could ever drum up. Reach for him as he passes by. This is his living room. We are not a social works. This is his living room. We come and pray. We come and meet him. So if you need freedom this morning, he's here to free you. His little freedom boxes are right down here as soon as your knees get on the ground and your brain kicks into gear. Oh, God, I need you. Forgive me. If you don't want to be forgiven, that's fine. But don't accept it. Don't expect anything from God except hell here on earth and a later hell that you'll get to enjoy more. Because he offers himself and he offered his son for Mr. Blockhead, me, Curtis. He offered his son in place. His son died, which I had no reason to. But Jesus looks me in the eye and says, will you belong to me? Will you do what I say? And I will take this approach from you and reproach from you and I will take it and put it on the cross so my father can see it. If you have something that you need him to get on the cross, you meet him at his altar and he will free you. He will free you. Now remember, nowhere in scripture are you supposed to go in, ah, Jesus forgive me of my sins. That's phony theology. Jesus says and God says, you repent from that and repent is, I'm not doing that anymore. I am not doing that anymore. And when Jesus hears that, you know what he says? I now forgive you because you made a determination in your heart. So there's no forgiveness unless we repent. You want me to take you to chapter and verse about in the book of Acts, chapter two, Peter stands up, all the Hebrews are standing there saying, Look at this, the Holy Spirit's here. Oh my goodness, he, he's prophesying. Oh my goodness, the flames of fire on people's head. What, what must we do? They, this is God, what must we do to get this? What the first word Peter said. So how's that changed? It has not. But is that so complicated? That we can't bow the knee and say, this day, I will do it your way, and from now on. Now, I realize you may crawfish a little bit and forget later on tomorrow that if you man it in your heart today, whatever offenses you have that deserves the penalty of death and hell, if you mean it today and you want free, he still will take away all the past sin. He can deal with our future sin too, but it's the same method and the same process. I do that 10 times a day. I was standing in the fishing store and there's this little redhead behind the scene and you know, we were joshing around, Pete and I, and, and, and you know, smiling and laughing and you know, she's, you guys want a fishing license? Yeah. I want one of those illegal alien ones that I don't have to pay for. <laughs> she said, I can be a smart blank too. Oh, she got offended. Now, it was in her head, the offense was, but I felt bad because another creature on earth that has the possibility of coming to God, I injured them somehow. I fell in a little trap. I almost wanted to cry there. And I'm, I'm, why? Because the person's soul was injured. And later on it came out after, I said, oh, ma'am, I, I, I have to beg your forgiveness, please. I'm so sorry that offended you. And she said, well, it's all right. I just have to work all around all these fishermen that come in, hard chill. I got a thick skin. 
because they always give me trouble because I'm a lady. <laughs> I just saw somebody struggling in life with the bitternesses and the hurts and wounds that can't be taken away except by Jesus. And my heart wasn't offended, wasn't rejected. I saw somebody struggling in their own blood that couldn't make it to God. I saw somebody struggling in life that feels under in everything. And I saw that she took the one little simple joke I had and put it upon herself, and I, I had to free her from that. Do you want to be free this morning from the things that are heavy weight upon you? That as we begin to sing to God, would you reach for him and say, I'm, I'm ready, Lord. I want to sign a contract with you today. I have never signed a contract. Or how about this? I've signed a contract, but I've broken it. I want to re-sign a new contract with you. All these things are supposed to be dealt with while we've got, we're reaching for him. So the first sermon's free. <laughs> and I hope it makes it free. So as we worship him, reach for him, call upon him. Call upon him to free you from yourself and your ways and your thoughts. Call upon him to free you from your plan, for your plan is nothing but death. So shall we pray? You give him an invitation to come and speak to you. Lord Jesus, we humbly come to you. And we cry out to you, for we need you so much. We don't know that we need you. We're too macho inside. But Lord, when we see you in your greatness, we shrink and melt like wax down to the infantile that we are. But we act like little babies that need their diapers changed. We're hostile. We have bitterness in our souls that makes a bad crack about everything and we can't see the light of day and we have no hope without you. So we pray, oh God, that you would come and sweep over our souls. We need a change of mind and we need a new heart. And you're the only one that can bring them. So come and flood this room, oh Holy Spirit, with your presence and come surround us with your angels and receive our worship and grant to us that we could have some divine encounters with you in this little service, in this little building, in this little people today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Stand and worship with us. You do not have to stand the whole time, but um, if you want to start off by standing, that'd be awesome. Kind of wake you up. Get the blood a moving.
a good thing too you have such a little view of who I am and who I can be I tell you you've seen my hand but am I a hand no I am so much more than a hand I'm so much more than a voice you may have heard my voice but that is not me I tell you I am so much more and I tell you those who come incline their knees and bow before me and cry out for more of me their reward is great for I will reward those who diligently seek me. Do not seek just, just enough of myself for respectability, for a feeling of safety. I tell you, child, I, it would be so much better for you if you were to become unrespectable, that you would take on the contempt of those around you so that you could rather forsake those things and have my presence. For I have it in full measure to pour out so much more than just a hand of provision. So much more than just a word of what to do and where to go. For I am greater than those things. But I have those things for those who find me. Did I not say I will be found of those who seek me? Cry out. Cry out. Humble yourself. Acknowledge your lack. Acknowledge your lack so that I can give you that which lasts eternally. For I tell you, I have much more to give you eternally that can be accessed now. Two judgments to make. Listen carefully. If you do not believe, this is a prophecy and a word 
from Jesus for us. Would you raise your hand, please? Second judgment, if you believe this was a direct prophecy from Jesus to us about getting our act straightened up and you receive it, would you judge it by raising your hand if you believe it is? Lord, we thank you that you still speak in our midst, just like you said you would in the New Testament. Child, I stand before you. I am here today. I stand in front of you, and I see that you are hungry, you are thirsty, you are almost naked. And you are in fetters and chains. And I'm standing in front of you with my hands out, waiting for you to take my hands, that I can offer you food you have never eaten, water you have never drank, clothes you have never worn, and lead you out into the sunshine of my glory. And I declare to you today that this place, this morning, you are in the presence of my sheep. And my sheep testify to my goodness. My sheep testify to my ability and more than my ability to be able to provide to tender, to look after, to be my sheep and I their good shepherd because I lead them to wonderful fields of grass and still water. I lead them to places where they are in knee-deep, lush grass full of the nutrients of my spoken word. And they can testify that I am their Savior, their King, and their great God. And I'm standing before you, not angry, but I'm standing before you with my hands held out that you would take my hands and let me lead you out. Judgment number one. Does this sound like Jesus speaking in the scripture? Raise your hand if it does. Judgment number two. If you do not believe this is prophecy from God, would you please raise your hand in judgment against it? Judgment number three. If you truly believe Jesus is standing in our midst and he is speaking using man and he is directing us with his voice, if you're in agreement that it's him speaking, would you raise your hand? And Lord, we have done our duty in judging it. For it speaks to our soul to come to you. It speaks to our soul to turn away from those things that would distract us from you. The devil wouldn't speak that, and we certainly don't, but you do. So thank you for your adjuring to our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I hear the Lord speaking, and he says, My son, I am not ashamed of you. I know that you fall and fall. But what thrills my heart is that you always call upon me for freedom. And I keep hearing that call. And if you will get in the right place to be fed the right way, with the right nutrients, the changing transformation can begin to take place in your heart. I see your intense love and your intense desire for me. But the conditions that you're in and the surroundings that you're in, you cannot escape the past, nor can you escape the plans of the enemy. So if you want me, come to where I am. If you want me, make me your life. 
And I know that you want me. For your heart is crushed every time that you wade off into darkness. But I always come. And I always speak to you. And you always respond. And you always come back. Know this in your heart. I love you. And I forgive and wipe your past. Everything that you've done, I, I take it. It's gone. I forgive you. And I love you. Now chase after me. And don't be distracted by life. Chase after me. And you will find me. So we judge this. If you believe this is a word for this body and it matches the temperament of Scripture and God's mind and heart, would you raise your hand, please? If you believe this is prophecy to us as a church, would you raise your hand, please? A personal thing. Put your hands down. If this word was directly for you, and you've been a little Indian scalping people and doing bad things. And Jesus spoke to you and you want to receive his freedom. And this prophecy personally to you, would you raise your hand, please? And let it be so. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you can even speak to the depths of the darkness that's within us. I thank you. We want. Oh, Lord, to know you more. Receive his freedom and worship him now. Deep within my soul 
My child, I have not called you to a solitary walk with me. Yes, it is true that each one must individually come to me, repent of their sins, and be received into my body. But it is by my Holy Spirit that I baptize you, I immerse you into a body of believers. You cannot walk this life on this earth by yourself and be victorious. You must walk hand in hand, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with other believers who can help carry your load, who can help walk with you through the trials and the tribulation. For did I not say that in this world you will have tribulations? Yes, you will. You'll have plenty of them. You need brothers and sisters who can come alongside of you and help you. I'm always there for you. But you need flesh and blood who can walk with you and carry you when you're too weak to walk by yourself. Do not think that you can walk this way of the kingdom by yourself. You need me. You need believers. Reach out to me today. I will knit you together. I will baptize you into a body, true believers who love you and help, help carry your burden. Let's judge this word. If this, you believe that this is Jesus speaking in our midst, would you raise your hand? Let it be so. My child, you know in my scripture that I have said that I do not withdraw again. Once I bestow a gift upon you, I will not withdraw it. That is why many have turned away, because they have seen people take my gifts that indeed I have given them and use them for their own vain glory. themselves and not to me. 
stop playing around like a child, a petulant child. I'm asking you to lay down your ways and pick up my ways. So what I have given you may not be counted against you because you have used it for yourself. Rather, counted for you because you have used it for my kingdom. That you have used the strong will that I have given you for my kingdom. I love stallions. I love taming stallions. I love taming a stallion that was once wild and now pulled my chariot. Breeds fire and is noble and is righteous. Please become a noble and righteous stallion. Stop kicking against the goals. Stop kicking against what I'm trying to give you. Stop kicking. Scripture says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. That we are to test all things and hold fast that which is good. And the spirit of prophecy is given in our midst for the edification of the body. Let us judge this. Is this consistent with the Holy Scriptures? Is this consistent with the heartbeat of our Lord in edifying and bringing us together in the unity of the faith and of the Spirit? Would you raise your hand and judge? Is this the voice of the Lord in our midst? Let all things be established by two or three witnesses. Father, we pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us that we have used our strong self-will for ourselves. That we have neglected the pulling the king's chariot. That we have not allowed ourselves to be brought under. Would you pour out a spirit of contrition and give us the repentance we need? We ask your forgiveness, Lord.
other places. Oh, that we would come to you as your children and just know your Father and arms around us. and That would be enough. That only you, Lord, would satisfy only you, God. I feel like the Lord was showing me a picture of a puzzle piece. <clears throat> And I felt like the Lord was saying, you on your own are just a puzzle piece and it doesn't make sense. The picture that you see isn't a full, complete picture. You can't make sense of it. And the ends, you don't know where they go, but I do because I'm the one who designed the puzzle piece and I'm the one who has the picture of what the puzzle is to look like. And if you fit into me, then you'll know and you'll see. So be my little puzzle piece and let me put you where I want you. Because I'm making a beautiful picture. If you believe, this is prophecy from Jesus to us. To be one who fits in with his plan. Would you raise your hand in judgment, please? Yes, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him with awe-inspired reverence and worship him with obedience. And he rescues each of them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. How blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, reverently fear the Lord. You, his saints, believers, holy ones, for to those who fear him, there is no want. You lack nothing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord with awe-inspiring reverence and worship him with obedience. If you believe this is a word from the Lord, would you raise your hand, please? Lord, we thank you that you continue to speak to us, continue to encourage us, continue to try to get us just to follow what you say we thank you thank you thank you let's go on here am i all of me every step is to see
God. I would say the word about the puzzle piece, just that um, that we can be a part of something bigger and greater in the Lord and that um, we can't truly know who we are and where we fit in um, without that and just how much we all need that identity and, and purpose and how that's something we can find in the Lord. So. It's easy to hate myself for how many times I fail and how often I fail. But I will always drag my body back onto the altar. I will always drag my body back into the presence of the Lord. The closer you grow to the Lord, at least for me, the more frustrating it is to fail. When you really have a real relationship with the King, the disappointment of failing a king is something that is beyond any human emotion. When you see his face, when he reaches out and touches you for real, and you disappoint him, and you fail him, it is the most heartbreaking thing a human can do. Though I may not have the power to overcome all things yet, by the power of the Holy Spirit that he is changing me and giving me the power to overcome. And retrospectively, he has helped me overcome so many things, so many attitudes, so many false doctrines, so many demonic thought processes. He has allowed me to overcome myself and I praise him and I thank him for that. That his hands are outstretched to us, calling us to come back to him no matter how many times we fall. And also the word that we're knit into a body. We're not just, can't just make it on our own. Us and Jesus, me and Jesus got a good thing going, as the old song said. But we need our brothers and sisters, and we need to let them knit us into a body. And this is my body. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just really felt the presence of the Lord here today, and um, and I and I also felt that same calling that Jarena was saying, just to to come. And um, I, as I was sitting up there worshiping, I I just felt um, such a I don't even know how to say it, but uh, such a desire for him to be my one desire and and the and then 
But I know sometimes when I walk out of here, it becomes something totally different. So I just see the importance of being here with my church family and my bo the body of Christ because we encourage each other in that so much. I think Gail almost took my words. Uh, just that sense of family, that everything is to be done for the edification and building up of the family, and how every joint supplies what is needed, and how much revelation we get, how, how our hearts burn within us because the word of God, the God comes forth, where, where we are assembled and called into his name. And I just, I, he's so amazing. I'm the one that came through Frank about the stallion because I always refer in my conversation as the wild stallion, the red-headed, wild Oklahoma rebel. That, that's what I'm saying. That is the prophecy, that I'm the stallion that I've learned to take myself will as the wild stallion and pursue the Lord with that and wrangle that down. The Lord's used that to do that and chase after the Lord and that's been a wild way that the Lord has used to the stallion to wrangle me down anybody else there were several prophecies that spoke to my heart the puzzle piece the um, your ways aren't my ways, the integration of the family, um, it, it, it all just kind of, over the last couple of years that I've been here, it, I kind of feel like that there was a picture, but it was kind of a little bit of a blurry picture, and now it's becoming with more clarity and more distinction, and his incredible love and about his being the shepherd and it was just all so enriching and encouraging and the magnitude was phenomenal. Last call. Last call. And before Jackie gives announcements and we wanted to read this scripture, please stand as we read scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what I want you to judge, have we had a service in decency and order according to what the scripture mandates? Follow the way of love, eagerly desire gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially prophecy. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries in the spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their strengthening encouraging and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you have the gift of prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. When, what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together? Each one of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Two or three prophets may, should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if the revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you call... You can... Sorry. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in the full congregation of the Lord's people. Do you agree with what scripture says? Amen. Have we stayed right on the rails of what it says? Yes. Amen. You may be seated. During, whoop, oh, there we go. During um, worship, I kept having this picture of a little child, and you know how they, 
you, some of children learn sign language, you know, and they want to, they ask for more. And I could just see little eager faces going more, more, more to the father, and he would just giving more and more and more. And um, anyway, it's very precious. So I have some few announcements. Of course, we had um, Pioneer Club yesterday, and I want to thank you, those of you who were able to come and help with that. And Bob, um, Neff coming and helping the kids understand concrete <laughs> and how to deal with that. And they made these stepping stones that they'll be taking home. And it was a really, really an awesome time with those kids. And um, and, I, and I want to take a moment to thank, really, truly thank you all. And I'm so grateful because we don't really have a sign-up sheet and expect you to participate so many times, a, you know, a year or to come or to do. or, or And I, I'm just so grateful that y'all, that you would allow the Lord to be head of this church and that we don't spend a lot of time organizing and structuring and that I never know who's going to come and help. I don't ever, I never know if it's just going to be me and how the Lord draws you and calls you and you come when you can come and you come as you hear his calling and you come and help and participate and it's always the right amount of people. It's always the people that need to be there and I just so, I so appreciate y'all listening to the Lord and allowing him to direct you so that I don't have to because I'm not good at it. I'm a bad director. I don't want to do that. And so thank you for for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and His leading. A couple announcements. We have service tonight at 5, so I hope you can all come back for that. What is this clown up cheap up here for? Is that who we are? That's who we are, I guess. Anyway, I shouldn't play with it. <laughs> Leave the animals alone. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, so we have service tonight at five. I hope you can all come back for that. And then um, Tuesday, intercessory prayer Tuesday. Okay, Tuesday at ten. And then Wednesday we have our service. Of course, um, we ha looks like we have a main dish and a and a side dish or or salad signed up for. Sorry, my voice is like lovely, I know. But we do not have a dessert. Oh, dessert is taken care of. Okay, great. Between then and now, it's been taken care of. Sweet. And then <clears throat> this Friday at 6.30, we will have, um, the sound guys are having fun with me. This Friday at 6.30, we have um, our movie night. So bring your goodies and snacky foods and we just will eat really badly and, you know, amen. amen. Have a good time and watch a, a, a movie. I don't know what it is, so it's always a mystery when we come. And we'll find out when you get here. But it's, we'll start the movie at 6.30. So if you plan on bringing some food that you're going to cook here, then you need to come before that, okay? And um, if you want to eat, then you need to come before that. The movie starts at 6.30. So come anytime that afternoon, evening, and we'll start that movie right at 6:30. And then um, on the next, on so the next day on Saturday, we want to have a work day. We've got a lot of. Um, in fact, let me back up to Wednesday, because Wednesday, if you could come and help, kind of sort if some of you ladies are available to come about 10 o'clock we're going to start sorting through things and getting things ready to move because on saturday we want to come at 10 and move the rest of the stuff out of um, one of the, the last storage area that we have we're going to move it over into carlton's and then i mean from carlton's into our new storage area and then at 1 30 we have a beautiful wonderful exciting fantastic violin recital and so um, if y'all could come and, and stay for that that would be fantastic to be able to cheer these two young ladies on in their endeavors to play the violin and there'll be other the other students that that the teacher has and so so you'll hear some really amazing violin playing and then um, so that's on Saturday at 1 o'clock 1 30 so and there will be like uh, treats and cookies and stuff afterwards. So, so you'll get fed for your work and your time. So with sugar, which, yeah, works for me.
forget to turn on my mic. <laughs> I, I get the sense of Jesus' love to speak to us if we want to do what he says. Do you realize the judgment that comes over you if you don't want to do what he says? So what happens is you become sleepy. You won't hear. He'll make sure you will not hear, for you're not worthy to hear the words that he is willing to speak to us to bring us closer to our Father. Now, I quoted the first pope of the church earlier, Peter, the great Peter, Pope Peter stood up and said, repent. Did he not? Yes. What are we supposed to repent of? How about our stubbornness? Stubbornness to what God says. How about our flesh, our will? I, I was thinking humorously that today's message should be called the hostile gospel. Because the gospel is not a gospel of love. It is a gospel of your flesh needs to die. The truth is, Jesus said it, those who will save their life will lose it. And those who will lose their life in God will find it. Now, if that's not hostile to what I want to do, I don't know what is. And I can't change that for you, for that's what's in Scripture all you can do is just resist. So with that, how about we get into the Word? I have a lot of Scripture to share with you, and we are going to have the joy of actually reading some things that Jesus really wants us to hear. You see where it says, verse 47, He who is of God hears the words of God. Now, there's a life-threatening thing. Because if you don't hear the words of God, and it's just... Blah, 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 you, you remember the Charlie Brown cartoons? The, and the teachers there... The, anybody remember that? Yes. If God's that way to you, it's because you don't want to hear him. So... I want to show you something. Jesus is speaking. And remember, the word rhema means someone standing there, does it not? So let's see if we can get this thing to go. Oh, uh, you're over on this street. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to just call up this word for you. Well, that's... Let's go over here, number one. I always forget about their commentary. I don't care what theologians say. Let's get into the definition. It's particularly a word as uttered by a living voice. Do you understand? Jesus said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema, someone standing there, and that someone is Jesus Christ. So I, I love going into definitions. Let's get back to you our scripture of the day. He who he, he he who is of God, here's the words of God. You need to make a judgment. Do you shut down or do you hear? Because if you shut down, it means you're not hearing the words of God. And if you're not hearing the words of God, you don't belong to him yet. I speak the truth. Why don't you believe me? He who hears, he who is of God, hears the words of God. And for this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Now, if that threatens your soul, well, how about you button up your shoes and get saved? That's a simple thing. Or you can go suck your thumb. Your choice. You can be mad about it. Well, he just said I'm not saved. Yeah, straighten your face. I don't want to see you go to hell. You're not supposed to go there. God made you. God's got you right here to make you all miserable or to make you absolute delight about, I have a God that wants to save me. Now, let's get out, drop down to 55, and then we're going to get into the meat. And you have not, that's, you have not come, let's back up. Let's do 54. And they're asking him questions. See, he's been needled to death by 
the religious, those that think they're okay. And he just flat tell them, you don't know God. Now, these are people that have been church people all their life. They were born church people. They were delivered in a basket, probably right there at the gate. Birthed right there in the temple. But that they don't know him. They don't know him. So Jesus is there, and he's healed thousands of people. And miracles are going on. And the Pharisees are following him. And it, who, who, are you, who are you to heal that guy? Who are you to do this? They really got upset when miracles started happening. The religious hate miracles. You know why? Because it points to the fact that there's a God here. And if there's a God here, now I've got duties and responsibilities to that God. Do you, you understand that? The miracles happen as, a resp as, as God declaring, I'm here. How are you going to act in front of me? What are you going to do in front of me? So he said, I, I, if I, they were accusing him. Well, you're here, you did all those miracles just to glorify yourself. And he said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. I mean, many pseudo-Christians, that's false Christians, people who have taken the name of Christ in vain. Did you ever see that in the book? It says, do not take the name of Jesus or name of God in vain. That's someone who says, I belong to God, but don't live it. It's not somebody that knows how to curse words. It's somebody who says, I'm a Christian, and they don't act like it. That's taking his name in vain. He says, you have not, he's, but you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I would be a liar just like you. Some people think Jesus was mamby-pamby. He's talking to the guards and the police and the high priest saying, if I denied I, am, I don't know my father, I'd be a liar and a skunk just like you are. Sometimes he was real friendly and said, you snakes, you hypocrites, you vipers. You're full of dead men's bones and coffins. Why? Because they said to the religion that they're okay. So I don't care what denomination you think you are. You're not saved by that. You're saved by your commitment to Jesus, your commitment to God. You're the only one that can sign that contract. Now, we're going to skip down and... To chapter 9 is going to be the focus. Now, I gave you that because, see, he's got a whole pack of Pharisees on him. People are getting healed and healed and healed, and miracles are happening. And he's speaking the words. He is God. He's not quoting the Old Testament. He's God. And every word that he speaks, it holds the weight and the creative power that God spoke when he made the universe. Why? Because now God is walking in our midst, and he's speaking words within you that will make a new universe within you called the kingdom of God. And so he passed by and all the Pharisees are crunching in against him. I don't know if you know this, but the scripture didn't come with chapter and verse. It's just, it's just, it's written, one book written like a letter. So he passed by and he saw a man from birth and his disciples asked him, you know, this is a snooty religious. Now, that was he a dirty, rotten sinner, or was his parents? Doesn't that sound familiar? Whatever de denomination you're from, or demonic nation. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sins? This man or his parents? That he would be born blind. And Jesus answered, it was neither. This man sinned or his parents. But it was so f that the works of God might be displayed in him. Can you imagine? He's born blind so that something could happen that would make God stand out that I'm here. What a gift to send to us. And what an honor badge this man will wear when we will get to heaven. And say, my goodness, for 40 years you were blind. God made you that way so that you could be a spectacle to me of my blindness. And then he makes the statement, we, and it is plural. He's talking to his future 
disciples and apostles. We must work the works of him who sent me. What does that mandate for us if you're his disciple? You're not here to decorate yourself with toothpaste or birthday cakes or whatever you want to do. You're here to do the works of him who sent Jesus. If Jesus is in you, his agreement and covenant, if you've made a covenant with him, if he's in you, is it, okay, little skunk, I'll die for you, and I'll take your sin to the cross, but here's the deal. I get to come back, and you ask me to live in you. Now, I get to use your body to finish my father's work. He's the first body snatcher to come along. <laughs> I like those sci-fi things. So our calling is to do the works. He says, as long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. I meet some people that are just totally asleep to God, and they will never do anything for God. Everything is about them because they're, they are their own God. He says, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. How many of you... Truly, truly, I've made a proper covenant with God, and he, Jesus, lives in you. Then if he lives in you, he is the light of your whole world. Would you agree with that? And the reason I say that is because, yes, I know Jesus died, but he was also resurrected. And the whole New Testament is about his resurrection and about him living and about him being, and about him moving, and about him teaching us how to come and be a part of God. And so this guy is blind there, and after he had said this, he spit on the ground. Now, what did God make us out of to start with? Okay, God spit, right? <laughs> he says he took the molecules of the atomic structure that he made earth out of our little Bible. The poor translators just say, well, he took dirt. <laughs> no, 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 no. He took the molecules and he made something and he formed it and he fashioned it. It had a full mind. It had a full thought process. It had a full body. But it didn't have the Spirit of God in it. It was blind. It could not see God until God breathed in Adam. Then he said, after he spit on the ground, he made clay of the spit. And he applied the clay to the eyes. Can you see God working with the clay man to start off with? How many of you ever had Play-Doh? Huh? Adam was the first Play-Doh set. <laughs> oh, yes. He put clay on his eyes. There's only one being that's ever worked with the dirt of this earth. And now it's God. And now God's standing here. This guy is a beggar. He's been blind probably for 40 years. That's a long time to be blind, isn't it? He's never seen anything. And then Jesus makes a statement. He said, okay. I put the mud on your eyes. Now, you go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I'm sure you're up on your history about the Tower of Siloam, the Pool of Siloam, Shalom, Shilam, the King's Pool. It was, at the, it was at the gates of the fountains. There, there was a special set of gates there on the, on the city, on the temple then. It's fountain gates. Guess what's behind the fountain gates? The fountain? You remember the fountain of life that Jesus talks about? The river of life, the flowing waters of life. This particular pool was the pool of Bethesda, is the one that had all the, uh, the porticoles over them. About 700 people would crowd in around that one because the angel would come and steer the water and people would be healed. This pool was different. This pool is actually was in the king's garden. And you remember Jesus making the statement 
about now what do you think those guys that died those 18 men that died in the tower of shalom when it fell do you think they were dirty rotten skunks more than you were see because they, they were actually built a tower right there next to this pool and spring as they were building it it was for the king that he could look out and have a good view Every rock in it tumbled to the ground and killed all 18 right there at that spot. This spot is also, how many know about uh, Ophir? In, in the book of Nehemiah, children of Israel returned to rebuild the temple. And a, a guy named, I think Mizpah is the one that rehung the fountain gates, rebuilt the king's garden. But this particular fountain was considered an absolute holy, 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 holiest of all the water in Israel. I wonder if it's the one that went and got some spring water for David because this, this pool is the one that... You remember at the end of the great party, at the end of the great feast, Jesus stood up. Anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink of the waters of life. Guess what was being brought right past him there in the temple when he said that? Because the custom was at the very end of the feast, a Levite would be sent out from the temple, led by an entourage of soldiers, get everybody hours away, with an absolute 100% 24 gold pitcher. And he was to take and dip out of this special fountain and come and pour it out, give it to the high priest. Everybody would see the holy water coming, the water of God, the fountain of life, the water of God that God demands. And since we have none, it would be taken in to the holiest of holies and it would be poured out before God as an offering before him. This place that Jesus is talking about has significant meaning if we could just understand all that's going on. Because one of the questions I asked Jesus about this place was, well, those 18 men that died, were they just dirty, rotten eggs? And he said, they're no different than you are, but they were at the right pool. They were trying to build a tower, possibly even see God, because that was a really holy moment. And that's where the crowd of priests camped when they returned from Babylon with Nehemiah and Ezra, that spot. It's thought that Hezekiah, amazing king, is the one that dug the pool to catch the water of the spring. I'm trying to set the backdrop and when Jesus even drops a, a name or a place, it has great scriptural meaning. And if you can't catch the backdrop, who is he dealing with in front of Pharisees? The blind. The blind. So he gives us a whole chapter about our blindness, about our deadness, about our resistance towards God. We're such skunks when it comes to our resistance towards God. Unless, of course, he becomes real to you. If he's real to you, you're hungry and thirsty and you, you want to do it. And I remember I had difficulty for years to, to go down to the altar. Oh, my goodness. Why? But something in me. I needed something that it had I didn't have. And there's somebody that was there waiting for me to bend my knee. told him to go wash in this pool. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. How do we begin to see? We have to drink from the waters of life, wash in the waters of life. We have to flow in the waters of life. I want to get into it. I want to get in the spring and swim in it. For I need so much outer healing and inner healing and mental healing. He washed and he came back saying, therefore the neighbors, 
And those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, uh, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Yeah, why didn't they even mention anything about God? See, it's mostly beyond men's comprehension. We don't want to admit that God can heal because that means he's here. Now you've got to stop your being a phony in life. You've got to stop being snooty. You've got to stop being hostile. You've got you to stop. There's a God here. And if God's standing there watching you, I promise you, you're going to check your nose to see if anything is wrong. So when there's a miracle that takes place, it's a real assault to the religious. I don't believe in that. Matter of fact, you know what the Pharisees would always say? Jesus does a bunch of miracles. There's probably 30 of them in one day. They've been falling. They saw, and they had the audacity. Come on, do a miracle for me. If you do a miracle, I'll believe. I'll believe. He, he, he just basically said, you, you don't deserve to even see my father. He never did a miracle for a Pharisee, never. The only miracle, he said, I will show you as you tear this building down in three days, I'll rebuild it. See, they didn't even deserve to hear the righteous thoughts of God because they didn't want to change. They had their religion that saved them, but it was not God who saved them. And he goes on to say, verse 9, Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he's like them. He's like him. And they kept saying, I, he, he's standing there. No, I'm really the one. I, I'm one. I, I was blind. And where, No, it's got to be somebody else. We'll do anything except, except the fact that God is God, especially in something like this. I didn't want to admit it because they were blind to God. They didn't want to admit it because they don't want to open their eyes. I don't want to see. You might require something of me. He, he has a lot required. If you don't meet that requirement, he has a nice, warm, over, bakey, easy bake oven to put you in. And all I can say is good readings to the face of the earth. Just like the weenies out there that are hostile and contaminate the earth. If you don't want God's earth, you're a contaminant on it. The hostile gospel says so. But then he offers at the same time, how would you like to be transformed? Isn't, isn't that magnanimous of him? See, I, I just get overwhelmed that he wants to make me and you into a noble creature. Not an ignoble. Ignoble means you're all about yourself. And then it stinks, doesn't it? If you're all about yourself, everybody around you thinks you stink. Do you have something on your shoe? You know? You're all about yourself. It's not a comfort and joy to anyone. And all it does is give you pains when you look at yourself. So why does anybody else? Why would they want to look at your so-called great achievements in life. They're not achievements. They're from the den of darkness and wickedness, and God says, come into the light. Uh, he's offering some of his word today, because remember, he made the dust of the earth out of what he spoke, right? And so every time he speaks, he's offering, mixed with the water, which represents the spirit, will you let him put some mud on your eyes today? Will you admit there's areas of blindness? The fact that you don't want to do it God's way means that you're blind, but that presents some problems too. Now, verse 10, so they were saying, how are your eyes open? Who's standing there? The Pharisees. And he answered, the man uh, is called Jesus. He, he made some clay and he anointed my eyes. Now, remember, he said anointed. Now, he just used a holy word that said something in his hands was from God. Miraculously life-giving. And he put it in my eyes when he says anointed. And said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received my sight. They said, well, where is he? He said, I, I don't know. 
Why? Because he had gone and washed. That's, so they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly bond. He was arrested. And he was taken to the Pharisees' adjudication court where they kill people for blasphemy. That was on the Sabbath, on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and, and washed. I washed and I, and I see. A religious person is never satisfied. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man's not from God. He's talking about Jesus. Because he does not keep the Sabbath. What? He reached down and picked up some mud and put on somebody's eye? Well, they spoke the truth. But Jesus is God, and he chose his day to work on. It was a law that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. By, by admission on their part, they said he worked. Well, only God can do that kind of work. Amen. And he gets them to confess that. I, I think that's real clever on God's part. I like his cleverness. And they're upset with this guy. And therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who's a sinner, perform such signs. It's not possible. If you're a dirty little sinner, I've seen lots of charismatic and Pentecostal churches where people are dirty little sinners going around saying they performed all kinds of miracles and nothing happened, declaring all kinds of things from God, giving all kinds from prophecy. A dirty, rotten sinner can't prophesy. A dirty, rotten sinner is not supposed to lead worship. A dirty, rotten sinner that is not repentant shouldn't even be in the house of God. It's not a place for you to come and take a bath. You do that outside and then you come and kneel before him and say, thank you, Lord. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened his eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. I mean, only a prophet could do something like that. And I think we would have to even agree about that. Then the Jews then did not believe him that he had been blind and had received sight. I can tell you I have given testimonies and seen miracles and participated in those things. And How many of you have seen those things happen right here in this church? Right? Now, when you go tell some weenie about it, what happens? I don't ended. They don't say nowhere in Scripture it ended. What, what Bible are you reading? Konak the Barbarian? God does what he wants. He's God. And if you want to try to shut him down, that's what it is. He, he's not God. We are. We say that that can't be possible. And, and I love it. They get some blind beggar that knows nothing, has ever seen anything. God uses him to lecture the Pharisees. I just love that. Village idiot coming to educate the morons that say that they know God. And the Jews didn't believe him that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents. So now the policemen went and got the parents. But this is a heresy punishable by death, testifying that God did something, and if it turns out not to be true and they've given this testimony, he would have been put to death under their law. I've met some good Baptists like that. When I received the Spirit, they tried to literally put me to death. They exorcised me. You are excommunicated from church because you got filled with the Spirit. I'm serious. Every friendship I had, I was very active in a church of about 500 people. In the, and all I did was give testimony of seeing a little boy, boy's leg be healed and grow and the toes turn up. And he got up and took off running. They took the crutches off of him. And God healed him right there. And I was such a reprobate. I scowled about every person that said they got healed until this kid shows up. And when I told about the scrap, I saw him. 
His legs were this big around. I almost was weeping because of the snarled up of his body. He had on short pants. And then I watched as that silly woman down there said, right up there, God's healing this little boy. And I went and looked at his legs and, and I watched his toes uncurl. I got excommunicated from a Baptist church for sharing that. Now, I'm not going to scowl at them. Their leadership didn't believe in those things. Their cemeteries, I mean seminaries, don't believe in those things. I do. I saw it. And I can't stop being a witness. But the second you become a witness that there's a real God and you start living it, I promise you'll be cut off at the knees. This guy was. All he did was get healed. And so now they asked him for a lecture, of course. The Jews then did not believe him. They're in sin. What? That he had been blind. He sent for the parents. They brought the parents up and questioned them, saying, Is this your son <laughs> who was born blind? Then how does he see? Can you imagine that? Are they glorifying God? They can't. Because if they say this was a miracle... If they admit that he was blind, now they have to accept the fact that someone's here that's from God and we've got his steering wheel, we've got his temple, we got his throne, we got his scripture, we're in power. They'd have to step down, won't they? So there's there's some really deep things going on. This is this is this is high court in the Pharisaical place that Jesus would stand and stand judgment. This is a place where Peter would stand and John and be beaten. This is a Sanhedrin court. It's a major thing. They had over a thousand policemen. The temple did. And so they got the parents and brought them back, and the parents answered, it, or, is, is this your son whom you say was born blind? See, they're ready for it. They already made it. You're just, you're just making that up. It's only you who's saying that. We don't, we don't believe you. And how does he see? His parents answered him and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we know not. Now, how does this kind of apply to us? Is there things of God going on and you're so blind you can't see it? Jesus is going to make a declaration that's going to hit me and you right in the face here in a few minutes. I'm going to let him speak. But how does he now see? We don't know. Or who opened his eyes? They weren't there. They said, we don't know. Ask him. He's standing right there. Now, when they say he's of age, that means he's over 30. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. They had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, now, shall we dissect what that means? If anybody accepts that he's the Messiah standing here on the earth, the one that God sent, that's actually the Lord and the master of this temple that we control, if anybody else makes a statement that somebody else is supposed to sit on our seat of judgment, we're going to put them to death. They knew that, for that had been declared from the Sanhedrin. He was to be put out of the synagogue. See, to be put out of the synagogue... Well, that's a small thing. No, it's not. If you're put out of the synagogue, I, they used to do this for 2,000 years till about 50 to 60 years ago. Matter of fact, I had it exercised on me about 50 years ago. Because I gave testimony, I saw the boy's legs healed. Official trial was taking place in the church. An official judgment was made by the church and all the leaders to excommunicate me from church because I'd seen a little boy's legs healed. Now, I have to tell you, 
later on in life, a few years later, I got to lead some of those people into the Lord and into the bubbly fountain. They too got excommunicated when they started talking about that Jesus is here. His parents were afraid of the Jews. For this reason, the parents said, he's of age, ask him. They call the man again. Now the trial is in his second session. Uh, who had been blind and said, give glory to God. Why aren't you jumping up and down and saying, God did this, God did this. Stop saying that man put mud on your eyes. We don't believe he's from God. But do you see the implication of him putting mud? The implication was God is the only one that's ever played with clay. And the entire population, they were Jews, and they knew God's the only one that plays with clay. So they wanted him to say it wasn't because the guy played with clay, and it wasn't because of the God. It was only God who did so. And then they added, give glory to God. We know that this man's a sinner. Now the good lecture is starting. He then answered, uh, was this man's a sinner? I, I don't know. One thing I do know, that... No, I was blind, now I see. And I have to tell you, I was blind to the kingdom of God, blind to the presence of God, blind to the love of God, blind to the affection of Him, blind to the pathway He had, blind to the joys that I could walk in, blind to something I could be that I am not. If you're tired of being you, then Jesus is the only one that can bring the healing to your mind and open your eyes to see your king. You don't need to see another frog in the mirror. Satan looked into the mirror and he corrupted himself. And every time you look into the mirror of your confidence, of your insolence, then you know you're gone and you're condemned. And he answered whether he's a sinner, I don't know. Let's get on. I need to get down the text. So they said to him, what did he do to you? Say, so now explain us the, what method did he, did he get out some spiders and lizards and get a big pot boiling and throw some rats and snake stuff in it? Come on, tell us. See, they were looking to blame this guy that his healing was done by the devil and witchcraft. That's the accusation that's being brought against Jesus and against this man, that somehow he was healed by witchcraft. And uh, he, he, he makes the statement, uh, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered him, I told you already, I don't know. Listen, why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciple too, do you? <laughs> I love that one. And they're up there ripping their beards out and ripping their... <laughs> Remember... The devil's their father. Jesus gave us that statement. He said, those religious freaks have made a zoo out of my temple. They took over my charge. They took over my throne. And he told them point blank. He said, my, my, my God is my father. Your father is Satan. This is far from that. Well, just love Jesus and you can do what you want and He'll love you anyway, and oh, he, he just loves the world so much. I, here, just go ahead and sin. It's okay. You'll make it. No, you won't. You'll be a squashed cockroach. You'll be an on-fire mosquito. You'll be worthless to God, worthless to anything on earth, worthless to the relationships that you could have had. If God ever sets up for you to have good relationships, you will destroy those. You'll choke them to death on all the smoke that comes out of you because we were originally a child of the devil. It says so in Scripture. He said, I came to rescue you from the kingdom of darkness. And I came to rescue you from your father, the devil, to adopt you. And become part of the family of my father. Oh, these guys go on and they revile him. Now, that's a real nasty word. That means they cussed him out. Yeah, Christian cussing, of course. 
you know, you lazy, low good snake, you skunk, you, you know. That it, the, the other little cuss words that people use are just out of ignorance because they don't have any real, real quality to drive somebody in the ground like a peg. Now, Christian cussing can do that. It can drive you in the ground, right? Why? Because you're trying to walk with God and somebody else trying to use you for a tent peg. <laughs> drive you into their rocks. So they reviled him. And then they said, you're his disciple. We're the disciples of Moses. So are you a disciple of some denomination or some religion? Religion? You, you don't belong to Jesus if you're that disciple. And he said, we know that God has spoken to Moses. Well, how do they know? Were they there? It's like a thousand years later. Were they there? But yet they're giving testimony that we know that God spoke to Moses. But that also says that God didn't speak to them because they're saying that God spoke to Moses, right? I'm trying to get you to see their personalities so you can see yours in blindness. If you want to quote something about Scripture that you do not live, you haven't heard. You intentionally turned it off. I don't want to hear that. That's okay. He'll, he'll let you do that. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing. He must have been from East Texas. He's fixing to give them a good backlashing with long words that they can enjoy. Wow, here's an amazing thing, guys, that you don't know where he's from. Yet he opened my eyes. Wood and wood. Hint, hint. <laughs> Now, they're there. There's 70 of the judges that are gathered. There's different tiers going up with seating, and there's also onlookers for witnesses. <clears throat> and he says, or they say, well, we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is fearing God and does his will, he will hear him. That's what he's saying. Since the beginning of time, he's still speaking. It's never been heard of that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. Can you imagine him making that phenomenal Satan? He's just a beggar. He's still in his beggar clothes. And he's looking around and he's seeing all these hostile. He's never seen anybody hostile. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered to him, you were born entirely in sin. In other words, you're a bastard child. You're not a part of the Hebrew religion. You're not a part of the kids of God. And not only that, you are out. We remove your name from the rolls of God. You realize that the Mosaic law had the ability to remove your name from the rolls of God. Matter of fact, this Christian church used to have the ability. They would have judgments. Right judgment. They're supposed to judge. And if you didn't want to do things God's way, your membership was erased from the roll. You had a public trial, and you were kicked out of the church, and no one would dare talk to you on your cell phone. No one would be in business with you. Why? Because you refused to do it God's way. Matter of fact, that's all in Scripture in the New Testament, too. The church practiced that for 2,000 years, and then about the last 50 years, they started moving away from that in denominations of not doing what God says do to keep the body pure. Therefore, people get induced. Devils show up and try to drag you off into sin and their darkness and unbelief. So Jesus, he heard that they'd put him out. That's a major thing. Word was spread by the thousand guards and the Pharisees all over Jerusalem have nothing to do with this man. He was a beggar. You know who I'm talking about. He has been rejected by God and rejected by the church. Now, if the church rejected him, guess what? The parents had to disown him and disinherit him. It was a serious thing. So, Jesus heard that he'd been put out, and finding him, 
Wonder how God found that man. Do you think he had radar? He, he knows, if he knows where he was at and can find him, you think he's looking for you? Does he need to have some words with you? And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The guy answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, now he knew what the Son of Man meant. See, God was supposed to come as the Son of Man to reunite the people of Israel back to God because they had broken his covenants, his instructions. Are you an instruction breaker? And he said, Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one, look at my lips, he is the one speaking to you, so you don't under, misunderstand me. Now, I, I've heard many people say, well, why didn't just Jesus say who he is? Well, you had not read scripture, have you? He says it so many times that your ears ought to spin off your head. He says, you both see him, and he is the one talking to you. Jesus has never changed his ability to be able to speak to his little ones. And he said, Lord, I believe you. He was one of the first people to worship Jesus as the Messiah, long before the disciples did, and the apostles. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world, Boy, doesn't that blow your theory? Would you just know you're a judge? Are you drunk? Are you dumb? Did you eat a cactus? What's wrong with you? Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. It's red letter. Yeah. It's been adjudicated. For judgment I came into this world. Here's his judgment that he came in. So those who do not see may see. But his second judgment is for the morons that think they can see. Those who see may become blind. If he sees you resist him, he will intentionally make you blind. You'll never be able to come to him. He made the statement, no one comes to God except through me. No one. No one comes to God except I call him. So when he calls... What's my duty and responsibility? I better answer because he's watching and he's standing there. I couldn't be called. And since he's calling me, I've got to respond. And if I don't want to respond, he says, fine, be blind. That's right. That's right. And if God speaks something that serious, man, it'll hit you and it'll cover your life. And you'll go to sleep every time he speaks. Right. You'll never hear a word from him. Right. Intentionally, he causes that. What, what is it? It's a Jedi thing. <laughs> Just, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> well, Jesus sees you don't have a heart for him, and you're a frog in a skunk's disguise, and he said, go to sleep. You don't deserve my words. Stay away from those who will not receive his words. So Jesus said, I came for judgment. So can you take it to the bank, these two things he's judging? And if you say you know him, he'll make you blind if you don't do what he says. Those Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, well, are we blind too? Are we? <laughs> I just love watching Pharisees get all upset, you know. I do. Like a cat in a bag of fleas, you know, they just... Just, just scratch and hiss. And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have any sin. Gentle Jesus. But since you say, you see, your sin remains. Now, the word remains in there is a different word. It's the same word that God used within... Cain, when Cain slew Abel, he, he said, your sin of what your desires are, the wickedness is dwelling in you, Cain. The same word that's used, and the wickedness is indwelling in you. 
That's what the words that Jesus used. Is this interesting? <laughs> so he goes on to say, now he's talking about sheep. Remember, there's no chapter, no verse. Now, this is God. If you read the King James, it's verily, verily. If you read it in any other translation, including the Catholic translation, it's truly, truly. They weren't King James, you know. But it's the Greek. Truly, truly. It's God saying, let me verify this in front of you. Matter of fact, I'm going to speak it twice so that you understand it's me who's speaking. That's how important it is. He didn't have to speak twice to make the sun. He didn't have to speak twice to make the earth. He didn't have to speak twice to make the heaven. But dear God in heaven, why does he have to speak twice to me to get me to believe him? I'm slow. And he's gracious. And he knows I'm slow. So he speaks twice to me. I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep. See, there's some that will never enter into the fold of the sheep. They're goats. At the end of time, if you're a goat, you're lined up, you're walking with the sheep, and the goats will usually try to distract the sheep. I remember when I, I lived in Daisy, Oklahoma, Jackie and I did, the guy, farmer next door had, I don't know, a thousand, two head, a thousand, thousand to two thousand head of sheep, and they had probably three, four hundred goats, and the goats would walk down the fence line until they found a place they could get out, and they would teach the sheep how to get out. And the sheep's fur would just get right in the barbs. Now, once they got out, there was nothing to eat. Once they got out, there was no water. Once they got out, they weren't protected from the coyotes. But for some reason, the goat is saying, follow me, follow me. They'll go out and cut out a whole bunch of them, and then they'd get the little sheep bloop, under the fence, under the fence, under the fence. Those are usually the ones that you would find mauled to death by the coyotes. If you're his sheep, we'll have to stay in the pasture. But he's the shepherd. And we have to sit at his feet and learn of him. A wild sheep will usually stand far down at the corner. He's got his emotions all walked up. No oh, poor me, and everything is bad, and everything in life. And Jesus, the shepherd's up on top of the hill. Why don't you come over here? Don't stand down there. But he likes standing next to the faint fence because the old poor me creature of darkness is right on the other side. An old poor me darkness creature will tell them how to manipulate people into the sympathy for them of what they've had to endure in life who try to crap, capture other sheep until finally he slips out with his compadre called Satan and he gets the sheep to follow him. Or he'll listen to Satan enough to, Satan says, here, little goat that's in that field, here's you some loco seeds. Would you go plant those in the end of the pasture so that that good Little sheep that's over there, tell them you found something really good and exciting. You know what the good things that are exciting? If you're young and have, how would you like a free trip to Hawaii and go surfing with me? That local weed? You're going to go with a goat? Do you, do you see the local weed that was planted? See, we're led astray and captured because somebody helps us build a desire within us for something other than God. And will always keep us so busy we will not have time to grow in God and walk with God. And of course, I must tell you at the end of time, there in front of the great throne of God, it says all men. How many? All. We'll have to stand and give an account. Now, how did you get out of that? I meet many Christians, pseudo-Christians, false Christians. Well, I won't have to stand there. Are you calling God a liar? Did he say all men would have to stand before the throne of judgment? Yes. I, I believe him. I don't care about your phony fleology. See, it's not theology, it's fleology. <laughs> it's something you should flee. Get rid of it. Something that's going to eat you if you don't. 
I, I hate to speak to you in metaphors, but Jesus used metaphors for those who were slow of doing. He used parables for those who were slow of adapting. And so his teachings, instead of just saying, uh, thus saith me, don't do that. He'd have to give him this long parable, three chapters long, to say, don't do that. Why? Is it because he wants to be long-winded? Or is it just because we're dumb as a brick? <laughs> Anybody ever meet a smart brick? They're not too yakety. That's a good thing about them. So let's get back to this. He, he makes this statement. He's talking about the sheep. He's talking about... Now, you've got to understand the Bible was not written to the wicked. The Bible was not written to those who would not keep it. The Bible was not written to the world. It was written to the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, can hear him, walk with him, and know him. It was not given to the world. These instructions and do's and don'ts are not to those who hate God, not to those who want to do evil. These were only written to the church that Jesus stands in. Precious instructions teaching us, slow morons, of how to softly follow God. He said, come on, little lamb, this way, this way. Now eat this grass. It's a funny thing, goats. We had some goats when we were there in Daisy. We started out with one, and it turned out to be three. <laughs> and no matter what you did, you, you could not keep them from eating your fruit trees. You could not keep them from eating your flowers. You'd be standing there in lush grass, especially for them. I took one goat out that we had a problem with. We, we, it, it had a real attitude problem. So I put a little rope around its neck, measure out, you know, it's about 80 feet, tied it to a tree. That goat would get all the way out to the end of that rope, lean out and choke ah, 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 on its knees, and it would only eat the grass outside that circle. It would not take one blade of grass that was in a circle. So when Jesus begins to talk about the goat and sheep, it means that you want to select your grass outside of what he says. And you're going to be choking, right? How many of you choked in times past? How many of you would like to just move back in? I, I need a rope on me because I'm, 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 I'm a man and I can change if God will help me. <laughs> he goes on to say, but he who climbs up some other way, that's your thought process and your skunk religion that thinks you can be a part of God a different way than God mandated. You're a thief and you're a robber. Remember, Jesus even gives the example of a, the great wedding feast and, and somebody got in there. They weren't dressed. They didn't have the righteousness of Jesus on. They had their own. The master of the service, I said Master. If you don't want to belong to Jesus, if you want to belong to Jesus, you have to become a slave. That's the agreement. Amen. Not a servant, a slave. A slave don't choose nothing. And there's someone that's there and they're not dressed. And so the master of the ceremony sees him and comes up and, how'd you get in here? And he didn't, he's not asking. He doesn't want to answer. He don't care to get an answer. He's not listening for an answer. He calls the guard, get this guy out of here. So if you think you can get into God's presence on your own, dress your way, I'm hoping that you understand the metaphors that Jesus puts forth in these stories. You can't do it. But on the other hand, doesn't he offer us a way that we can do it? And why is that so hard? Unless you're a goat, because you'll get <coughs> choked to death out there trying to eat your own stuff. But he who enters the door is a shepherd of the sheep. There's only one door to God the Father. And who, ha who is the door to God the Father? Jesus alone. You can't get there. To him, the doorkeeper's open. You remember in Scripture, 
Jesus has been resurrected from the dead and he cuts across the earth and resurrects a few people and talks to a few disciples. Next scene, we see that he's sitting on the throne, but there's another passage in Isaiah. Lift up your heads, O ye ancient gates. Son of God is here. Open up. He comes in the back door. Those gates are his gates. And he went in and laid himself on the throne of God as the lamb that was slain for me. To him, the door opens. You can't get God's door open for your salvation for nothing. You're a skunk. And the sheep hear his voice. If you're not hearing his voice, you're not a sheep. But I got good news for you. You can become that. But you have to be resolute to stop being a, a skunky goat. To him, verse 3, the doorkeeper opens. And what happens? The sheep hear his voice. Are you, are you hearing him this morning? I hope and pray you're not hearing me. I hope and pray that you can see him. And he's the, he's the only one. Now, he was surrounded by Pharisees when he's saying all this stuff. And the blind guy is still standing there, too. And he's pointing at the blind guy. See, that blind guy heard his voice and responded and worshipped him. He's the first person to worship Jesus as God. And the sheep hear his voice. The doorkeeper opens. Who's the doorkeeper? Jesus. And the sheep, who's the sheep? <laughs> See, goats and sheep sound a lot alike. But goats get up on the rocks and they watch the sheep. And they look down at God. Well, I'm watching. I got my own way. I don't have to go through your door. It's kind of selfish of you to guard that door. I'll go around your door. Does that, does that sound like a goat? Yeah. Anybody know a goat? Yeah. Anybody know a goat? Yeah. Anybody know a goat? Yeah. What, what's this? Oh. That's an answer. <laughs> so you're supposed to participate with God. It's not a religion that you come and just eat your, your plum pie. It's one that if Jesus is speaking through his magnificent word, we're supposed to be witnessing, it's supposed to be responding, it's supposed to be taking it into our heart and saying, yes, you're here. Yes, I hear that, O oh Lord. Not to me. He's the one that's here. He's the one that's seeing whether you want to be responsive to him or not. And if you don't, that's fine. You will seal your fate. And you will stop skunking up his world. And every blessing he has for you, I promise he will withdraw them. Point blank. And I'll meet you some other time. <laughs> Can you pray for me? No, I can't. You were a skunk and you were a fool and you heard the word and you chose not to do it. And God sent these blessings upon you, and now you want to whine and cry about it and go live in the world and expect that he owes you something? Are you a toadstool? I hope you can hear his voice in this, not mine. I hope you can hear his heart. For we need the truth presented to us by God that gets down into our soul and rips the covering of a rotting flesh off. And we might respond... If God is king and God is real, he deserves an earnest response from him. every person that wants to call on his name. Amen. Now, I have to be the fool that gets up here and acts all this junk out. Amen. To just accept it, I could be nice and quiet. And Would y'all care for tea? No. <laughs> and it says here, we'll read this together. But we don't receive it that way. We're, we're good resistors, and he knows that. So he'll speak in circles for us because our mind goes in circles. Those who belong to him are hearing him right now. If you don't belong to him, you're hearing... Well, only up to the fact you don't belong to him. 
And if you don't belong to him, you don't have his blessings. You don't deserve his blessings. But he's given you a chance to hear about your crummy state so you can make a decision whether to change that or not. Are you tired of being a crumb? He makes this statement, not only do the sheep hear his voice, but he calls his, and he calls his own sheep. He's calling to you and says, will you, will you please become mine? Isn't that gracious of him? He doesn't disown us just off the bat. He knows we're just slow. And then he says, he calls his own sheep by name. How many of you, in this lousy sermon, I've heard God call you by name and saying, will you just come and do it my way? Yeah. Hello, together, please. Yeah. He's speaking. He's speaking down to the devils <laughs> and calling you by name. All you got to do is answer him and say, Lord, whatever it takes, I plan this day to make changes to walk with you. I plan this day to make a plan to get to you and do it your way from now on. That's reasonable if you're going to be his child, is it not? That's all he wants. He wants to see. I'm, he made the first move. If you made it and you're still buckled in your seat right now, he made the first move. And said, come and join me. He hasn't condemned you yet, but if you're a goat, you're already condemned, so you don't have to do anything. He says when he, he he's going to lead them out. See, once I come into him, now he'll take his little rope and put it on my neck. And he said, now let's go walk out here in the pasture in this world that I have for you. And, oh, did you meet this person? That's a relationship I have. Did you meet this person? That's another relationship. Did you think about, why don't you follow me, because I'm going to take you to this city. And you and I are going to dwell in that city. You and I are going to be in the kingdom. You and I are going to be in my father's house. I've got one of those for you. But it's only where Jesus is. It's his father's house. Then when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. See, we're right now, we're together. And I hope Jesus is speaking into your heart, whatever state it's in. But the big thing is, if you get enough of him, when you walk out the door, he's going to say, let's walk together. Let's drive together. And, of course, you're going to get to the red light, and some idiot's going to cut you off, and that Satan's going to try to blow you up. So, rah, 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 rah. so Jesus, okay, I'll go back to the church. <laughs> I'm going to ride with you. I'm reminded of the guy that's drunk, sweeping all over the road, and rolled in his car, and the, a guy shows up and says, Are you okay? And the guy, Yeah, I, I got Jesus riding with me. And the guy said, well, you better let him out. The way you drive, you're going to kill him. <laughs> Are you drunk in this life? Swerving in your own lanes? Building your own freeway going to hell or nowhere? And then trying to put up signs to get other people to follow you? That's what goats do. When he puts forth all of them, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. How many are hearing his voice right now? Now, now, please keep your hand up. Look around the room and see how many people are really hearing his voice. Look around. Now, if you need proof, either all these people are liars or God speaks. Amen. God's not a liar. He said, I speak to my sheep. And if you're not hearing, once you get busy and be a sheep. A stranger they will simply not follow, but will flee from, because they do not know the voice of the stranger. I mean, you think the false gospels that are preached out there are really strange. Yes, sir. 
And the people who do those things that way are strange. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what things in which he had been saying to them. And so Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Can I paraphrase that for you? Hey, blockhead, there is no other door. What is wrong with you? Can't you see? I am the door. There's no way to God. There's no way to heaven. The exit's filled with crowded head, people headed to hell. I am a door. He's not Mamby Pamby. He's a God. He's a man. And he's a man that's a God. And it's not the Red Green Show where you get to make decisions about possums and skunks and such. This is a serious God. We're going to face a serious God when he comes back. But before he comes back, if you're on his good side, one of his sheep, you're going to face an amazing God that will help transform your ugly thoughts, your ugly heart, your ugly, oh, poor me, that you try to drag everybody in your trash. He'll change that. How would you like to have a lovely flower garden come out of your mouth? Instead of when somebody comes up to hug you, all of a sudden you throw about 40,000 cactuses on them. You <laughs> did and that and this and that. Oh, do you love me? Oh, you're rejecting me. Dear God in heaven, who can live in this weather? Anybody know anybody like that? Raise your hand. <coughs> what? Is that a hand raise? Anybody know anybody like that? Okay, now don't put your hand up on this next one. Is anybody here like that? <laughs> we got one, one person. That, see, that's who we are. That's why we come to Jesus. We can't change the cactus that's in us. And everybody we try to love gets poked full of holes, and we wonder why if they reject us. Finally, they get out of boat pole. To, you know, let me hold you out there. I hear what you're saying, but it's hell when you give me a hug. But <laughs> now I got to listen to all your garbage. You're gonna throw up on me, and I'm not gonna talk about what else you're gonna put on the ground. And you want me to love you? How about we become lovable? And how about you stop being a thumb sucker about people rejecting you? They reject you because you're a sorry, sour pig. And if you don't want to be rejected, then stop being that sorry, sour pig. That's that simple, is it not? I hate to tell you the truth so hard, but it would sorely pleasure me if you'd hear his truth that he can change you from being that. And if you don't change from being that, then the good path that he has and all the good things he has for you will be withdrawn. Sometimes he puts good things in our path that we find to give us a chance to say, oh, I want to stay on this path. And if you choose that you're God, he says, fine. The good things are gone. And I know You'll call me. You'll be crying. The good things are gone. Well, how about we up and get back to score one? Your goat and your skunk, are you ready to change that? Right. I'm not going to mince words with you. Because if you're not ready to commit your goat and a skunk, how can you get into repentance? And how can you become a sheep unless you stand still and let God put your head in a vice and cut off your horns? See, I, I try to keep my head in his vice. I don't want any of the vices in life. My head clamped together in what he says so I can hear him. I still am one of his sheep, and hearing him is the most blessed thing on planet Earth. And walking in his continued abiding blessings is the most wonderful thing on Earth. And something that's even better for me personally is I turn from this hateful, bitter, spiteful, sorrowful, back 
biting words that are vicious. You realize those are stuck in your heart. That's who you are. It's not the circumstances around you. It's who you are. You will make everything stink. How many people are in agreement? Yes. But that's why Jesus came. If you're experiencing eternal stink, it's because you're not letting him wash you and you're not accepting what he says and you're not doing what he says. When you accept what he says, do what he says, the stink will go away. If you change your position, if you receive what he says, if you do, see, when the scripture talks about listening, it means that you heard it. Oh, that was you, God. You believed it, and you go and do it. It's pistion or pistius, which is faith or believe. If you don't do it, the scripture would say you didn't hear because you don't do it. So are, are you hearing him? Hello? A thief comes to kill in the story, and I, I think I, I want to... No, we'll read this. We'll read this. I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be sozero, delivered. Uh, do we need to look at that? Because I, I keep using that and telling you that. Ah, we have Shasta Saturday. Here we go. Let's go into that. It's delivered to make whole, to preserve. So when he's saying that, he's not talking about your after relationship with God. He's saying, delivered from the immediate danger and loss of destruction that you're in right now. Are, are, are we in agreement with that, what the thing says about the Greek? <clears throat> and we'll go in and out and find pasture. And the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. If you're a thief and you're in his church, you're here to hurt somebody else or to get them to follow you or do what you want. Because you're not doing what Jesus says. He says, I came to may have life, and they may have life abundantly. Now, there's a major statement. A God is speaking, and I came to bring life just like I did to planet Earth. I came to plant a garden in you. Now, what did God put man in the garden for? To work it. So if he put a garden inside you, that he comes and walks in. Have you been working it? Have you been walking with him every day? He'll come down in your, his garden and he'll walk with you. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. How many times past have ever been attacked by someone that said they were a Christian and they led you away into darkness? They led you away from God. They did that with intent because they were an assignment from Satan and didn't even know it. They just wanted you to come and crown them king and you to accept them as your God, you to accept their plans for your life, when whose plans are we supposed to accept? Jesus's. Is this still hitting home? Yeah. He flees. This, uh, this is a false shepherd. He flees. Mm -hmm. Because he's just a hired hand, he's in it for the money. And maybe you've seen some of the televangelists. They tell you to send them money. <laughs> right? Ask them for a rebate if you've ever sent in any. I say you're not walking with God right now. You're not preaching the truth anymore. Can I please have a rebate? Should we not? He says, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. Do you know him? See, there's an the important thing. Jesus accused the Pharisees, you don't know my Father. You don't know God. I know him. 
And now he's right in our face. And he says, I know my own. I know what they act like. I know how they think. I know those who receive my instruction. Those who drink my water. I know those who are filled by my spirit. I know those who will keep my instructions that are in the scripture. I know those. And I'll lay my life down for them. I do have other sheep which are not of this fold. He was speaking to the Jews. And now he's talking about the Gentiles, me. And I must bring them in also. And they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. What's the key mark of the Gentiles? They will hear my voice. John chapter 15. My sheep will hear my voice. That's the whole purpose of us coming and belonging to God, is that we might know a real God who's here. Now, is that too crazy for you? I don't think so. Is, is that too unreasonable of him? Or should we just say, well, just give me a book with some religion in it so I can make it up and do what I want and live my life my own way. Thank you. We have a frog in here. No one has ever taken it away from me. He's talking about his life. I lay it down on my own initiative. If you come to Jesus right now, whatever you've done as a termite in destroying your house, he'll lay his life down. You deserve death for destroying it. There's been many years of your life that you destroyed and you would not give to God. You were a thief because you are made to belong to God. But if you come to him, he's going to take that away. I've done it on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This command was given to me by my father. Let's just read some things that Jesus says. This verse 25. I told you, and you don't believe me. The works that I do are my father's. They testify me. But you don't believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give an eternal. Pause right there on that. Just one word. Your definition, my definition of eternal is after Jesus returns, is it not? Raise your hand. Is that true? The word is not eternal. The word is perpetual means from right now and forevermore. It says, I will give a perpetual life. And that word again, this is God speaking. I will give you a Zoe, which is a revelation of me, where you can see me, hear me, walk with me, know me in my kingdom. Life means that we are God aware, God conscious, God functioning, walking in the presence of God. And if you're not walking in the presence of God and his brothers and his sisters and his sheep, you're dead. Life is that God exists and we can see him and feel him and live and move and have our being in the kingdom now on a perpetual basis. I'm just telling you what the definition of the words are. God speaking for himself. The dumb men dumbed it down to our English language and left out the magnitude that we can know God. He says, and they will never perish. I, I need to hear that right now. I need that life right now because, uh, you know, I was real busy in my old life of doing some perishing things that I still think I should perish for. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. Things you did that you know you should perish for. And you're right. We will perish unless someone intervenes. Someone will intervene. His name is Jesus when we make a decision to love him. What's his definition of love in John chapter 14? If you love me, obey me. And those who don't love me, don't obey me. I meet many heretics, pseudo-Christians, that use Jesus' name in vain and say they love him, but they don't do one thing he says. If you love Jesus, you owe him your life. If you want to miss hell, give him your life now. If you keep your life for yourself, you will lose it, according to Scripture. 
And I will give a perpetual life to them in my presence, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them from my hand. Are you tired of being uh, snatched from his hand by people who say, come over here, I do it my way. Are you tired of being snatched? My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. Now, you think how great of the vices that have you trapped right now. Are there any? Do you have anything that kind of has you trapped? I have news for you. The Father's greater than whatever has you trapped. Jesus is greater than whatever has you trapped. And Jesus always makes a way when his little sheep gets trapped. He's greater than all. Is God greater than your problem? Yes. Yes. Is God greater than you? Yes. Yes. Is God greater than all the reprobates that hold you in relationships with themselves? Yes. Is he greater? Yes. Just come to him. He has a way. He says, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Jesus' whole intent is for us to become his children to bring us into the Father's hands. I and the Father are one. I showed you many good works from my Father, for which of these are you going to stone me? Now, you've heard what he had to say this morning. I have mostly read what he had to say. I'm trying to act out some of it. Hopefully you got that. But if you're not going to receive it, you got rocks, and you're going to kick dust at it, and you're going to spit at it. Has it not been written in the law, I said you are gods? Now, that doesn't mean we're like God. It means we're supposed to be somebody different than we are in our character, in our nature, in our purpose, in our life. We're supposed to be like Jesus who came here. He wasn't railing from his throne and trying to rule anybody else's life. He came and lived out on earth in character and nature of what we're supposed to do. And he offers to us who will believe in him to do his works, to walk with him, to know him, if you don't believe that his path is good for you, if you don't believe he has provision for you, if you don't believe he has right brothers and sisters for you, see, I, I happen to believe that he spoke to me and said, I got a wife for you. I had one of those and it boiled me in oil. I don't think I need another one, thank you. He said, well, that one wasn't for me. I have one for you that's from me. Took me a while to receive that. That I want you to move to this little town. Yes, Lord. I want you to go join a Southern Baptist church. Yes, Lord. Which I got kicked out of again. <laughs> I did. They asked me, would you go on a visiting session with us? We're just going to go out and pass out tracks and... Uh, in the, in, the, in the apartment complex, and I, well, sir. And we show up, and there's this guy in there, and his wife is listing. We've got three little kids, and are half starved to death, and live kind of in the cockroach neighborhoods and all that stuff. And he said, I'm just, I'm just dying. I'm so broken hearted. And I just said, you know, are you ready to turn to God? Are you ready to reach out your hand and grab him? Do you want... Do you want to know him? For he can give you a different life. He can give you a different substance. He can bring healing to the mess that you've got and the mess that you made. Do you want those changes? And he fell on his knees. Yes, I want that. I want that. I got excommunicated for leading that guy to God. They, they wrote me a letter and Jackie's, you're too zealous for God. I'm serious. 
Now, I didn't spin around and do the chicken walk. I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't prophesy. I quoted scripture and let the Holy Spirit move on a person's life. They amputated me. I was a cancer that looked like I could walk with God because God brought some healing in this man's life, and they saw it. They saw the change and the rescue of the guy, but they didn't get to participate in it. God is wanting to know, are you ready to be his slave? If you're not willing to be his slave, he don't want you for a child. That's his requirements. Have you not read the New Testament? Or you just tear out all the love sections? That's spiritual pornography. You just want the transparent God that can let you do what you want to do so you can run around naked. In your flesh. Am I surprising you? Let's do not use the word of God to get into our flesh. Instead, the words that God speaks is to deliver us from that naked person that's running around in the garden. Is it not? There's, a, there's only leaves that we can be covered with that will cover us. Is they're in the Bible. And they covered themselves with leaves of the trees, did they not? Dear ones, run after him and chase after him, for he's speaking and calling to you who are his sheep. And if you're not hearing him, you're not his sheep. If you're not hearing him, you're not entitled to all the great things he has. And that's okay. He's not going to make you do anything. He wants sheep that will follow him with joy. So shall we pray and ask him to receive us on the basis of what he said? Or you can reject it. Father, we come to you and we thank you for sending your son with such great swelling words that could transform us and that could bring us into a different life instead of the life of death that we live. We thank you. For sending the scripture that was spoken by the Holy Spirit through men that you raised up, but it was the Holy Spirit that spoke it, just like you said in Second Peter. So help us receive the things you have and live the things that you have that we might know you and walk in your presence. We love you, Lord. I love you. I love you which means I want to know more, to do more for you and you alone. You're my prize. You're my treasure in this life. I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. I hope that the Lord made it through your stone walls that you have in your maze. Now we'll be meeting at 5 o'clock. And remember, what are you coming back for? The disciples would stand and listen to the Lord all day long, and then they had a little campfire meeting that evening. Guess what the meeting was about? They got to repeat everything that God really spoke to them. They got to be the witnesses of how he taught them and how he instructed them. So if the word catches in your heart and revelation have come over to you, then be ready when we form a circle, sit around his fire. Be ready to express what God spoke to you in this meeting. Don't tell me about a book you read. Don't tell me about another testimony that took place last week. If God is here, then you're the witness of it. And if he spoke to you, you're the one that's supposed to give glory to him by praising and expressing what God spoke to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. You are dismissed, and don't forget to love on one another. Thank you guys for joining us out there, by the way.